Welcome to lecture 16. In today's lecture, we will discuss how rate constants vary with temperature according to the Arrhenius equation and determine the physical underpinnings of this empirically derived equation. This lecture will be broken down into four parts. In the first part, we will introduce the Arrhenius equation. In the following two parts, we will discuss two theories used to describe how to quantify reactions, collision theory and transition state theory, and relate them to the Arrhenius equation. Finally, we will calculate how the rate constant varies with temperature according to the Arrhenius equation. In the 19th century, the Swedish chemist Svante Arrhenius remarked that there was a linear relationship between the natural logarithm of the rate constant of a given reaction and the inverse of its temperature. This relationship is commonly known as the Arrhenius equation, and when written in its more common form, it reads, the rate constant Kf is equal to A times E raised to the power of negative Ea over RT, where A is a constant of proportionality and Ea is the activation energy. The activation energy is the energy required to overcome a barrier which separates the reactants and the products. It is illustrated in the figure on the right as the hill that the reactants A and B overcome in energy to become products C and D. The physical meaning behind the exponential prefactor A is more nuanced. We will now examine two theories, collision theory and transition state theory, and we will find that they produce relationships that, they, that are erroneous in nature. By doing so, we will start to elucidate the physical meaning behind the terms in the Arrhenius equation. Let's start first with collision theory. Collision theory is based on the premise that molecules must collide with the correct orientation and sufficient energy along their line of approach for a reaction to occur. The figure on the right illustrates the second point. In both images, the particles have a high velocity. However, in image A on top, the component of their velocities that lie along the direction which leads them to collide or their line of approach is very small. This means the likelihood of a reaction occurring upon impact is also small. In image B on the bottom, the particle on the left has a very high velocity aligned along the particle's line of approach. Therefore, there is a higher probability of the reaction occurring since there is more energy directed into the collision. Let's start collecting the terms necessary to quantify if a reaction will go to completion. The first thing we need to know is the number of collisions that occur. It is intuitive to relate the frequency of collisions to the concentration of the reactants. The greater the concentration of reactants, the more often reactants will collide. We can also quantify the fraction of these collisions with sufficient energy to overcome the activation energy. This is equal to E raised to the power of negative 1 times the activation energy divided by RT. This factor is Maxwell-Boltzmann in nature and is related to the partition function. The illustration on the bottom right shows two Maxwell-Boltzmann distributions, one at 300 Kelvin and the other at 500 Kelvin, with the shaded regions which indicate the fraction of particles that have an energy that are higher than the activation energy. The exponential factor quantifies this shaded region. In order to find a direct relationship between the rate and the product of the collision frequency and the fraction of collisions with energy equal to the activation energy, we will need to quantify more precisely the collision frequency. In order to quantify more precisely the collision frequency, we will first review the collision cross-section. The collision cross-section of a particle, denoted as sigma, is the area that if the geometric center of a second particle enters, there will be a collision between the two particles. This is illustrated by the yellow circle in the figure on the left. Once the geometric center of the second particle enters the yellow circle, the two particles have collided. This value changes for different molecules, but it should certainly be included in a formulation of the rate at which particles collide. Now that we have an expression of the cross-sectional area that a particle occupies, we can now determine the volume that a given particle occupies over a given time frame. This is illustrated by the cylinder with cross-sectional area sigma, and its length is dependent on the average speed of the particle times a given time interval. Using the kinetic model of gases, we can determine the average velocity of a particle, denoted as v in the angled brackets. The multiplication of this length by sigma gives the volume that a particle occupies. If another particle enters this volume during the specified time interval, then the two particles will collide. This is illustrated by the cylinder where any red particle, which are those that have their geometric center inside the cylinder, has an opportunity to collide with the blue particle, 
those outside the cylinder, shaded in green, will not collide with the blue particle in the specified time interval. Now, of course, all the particles are moving, and not just the blue one. To account for this, the square root of 2 times the average velocity gives the relative average velocity between the particles. Therefore, the cylinder has a volume of the square root of 2 times the average velocity times delta t times sigma. Let's assume that our reaction involves two particles, particle A and particle B. To determine a collision frequency between A and B, we multiply this collision volume we just determined by the density of particles, denoted as the concentration. Remember that concentrations are simply particles per unit volume, which is a quantification of density. If we divide this by the same time interval, delta t, then we now have the number of collisions per second. The extra value of 1 half is simply to eliminate double counting of collisions. We can then eliminate the factors of time and substitute in the average velocity from the kinetic model of gases to get sigma times the square root of 2 times the concentration of A times the concentration of B divided by 2, and all this is times the square root of 8 times the Boltzmann constant times the temperature divided by pi times mu. And in this case, mu is the reduced mass, which is equal to the mass of particle A times the mass of particle B divided by the mass of particle A plus the mass of particle B. This expression assumes that every collision will lead to a successful reaction if the particle has sufficient energy. However, this is not the case. One additional factor must be included, the steric factor P. This quantifies how often the molecules are in the correct geometry to react when they collide. In this image, there are three collisions. The top two are an effective collision since the NO is hitting the ozone in the middle oxygen. It would be hard to pull the middle oxygen out of the ozone, so these reactions do not occur. However, if the NO were to hit the ozone at a different angle of approach with this nitrogen atom facing one of the side oxygens, like in the bottom image, then it can remove that oxygen resulting in a successful reaction. This is what the steric factor quantifies. An interesting note is that the value of P is only restricted to be greater than or equal to zero. Since a collision can result in multiple products being formed from the reactants, P can actually be greater than one. So, for a reaction being A plus B goes to the products P with rate constant Kf, the second order rate law can be written as being equal to Kf times the concentration of A times the concentration of B. This is also equal to the collision frequency times the fraction of particles with sufficient energy to react, those with an energy equal or greater than the activation energy. If we were to cancel out the concentration of A and concentration of B, we were left with the rate constant Kf being equal to the steric factor times the collision cross-section times the square root of 2 times the square root of 8kbt over pi times mu, divided by 2 times e raised to the power of minus 1 times the activation energy over rt. Comparing this expression to the Arrhenius equation implies that the pre-exponential factor a in the Arrhenius equation can be interpreted as the collision frequency between the molecules. Let's now move on to the second theory which tries to describe reaction processes. Transition state theory is a more general theory which borrows from the notation of equilibrium. Consider the reaction where A plus B is in equilibrium with C double dagger, where C double dagger is an activated complex. Think of the activated complex as the moment that A and B are fused together, and could react either way, meaning that it could return to the reactants A and B, or form the products. We can write an equilibrium expression for this reaction as K double dagger being equal to the concentration of C double dagger over the concentration of A times the concentration of B. From this equilibrium, it is possible to estimate the rate constant using the Ehring equation, which states that the rate constant k is equal to kappa times the Boltzmann constant times t divided by Planck's constant h times the equilibrium constant capital K, where in this case kappa is the transmission coefficient, which is the fraction of activated complexes that actually go to products. Unless otherwise stated, always assume that it is equal to 1. This equation is based on the idea that the thermal energy is equivalent to the vibrational energy along the direction that the activated complex would vibrate and break apart to form a product. Since we are using a thermodynamic framework to describe the rate constant, we can then relate the equilibrium constant to the Gibbs free energy. Recall that at equilibrium, 
minus RT times the natural logarithm of the equilibrium constant is equal to the change in the standard Gibbs free energy of the reaction. Since we are now talking about an equilibrium between the reactants and an activated complex, we are discussing something called the activation Gibbs free energy, denoted as delta G double dagger. When this is substituted into the above relationship and then solved for the equilibrium constant k double dagger, what we get is the equilibrium constant being equal to e raised to the power of the negative of the activation Gibbs free energy over RT. We can also express the activation Gibbs free energy in this equation as the activation enthalpy minus the temperature times the activation entropy. So the Ehring equation can be rewritten as the rate constant k being equal to kappa times the Boltzmann's constant times T divided by Planck's constant times E raised to the power of the activation entropy over R all times E raised to the power of the negative of the activation enthalpy over RT. This is an interesting result because we again have an Arrhenius relationship where this time the prefactor A is now related to the thermal energy of the system and the activation entropy and the activation energy is simply the difference in enthalpy between the reactants and the activated complex. Here are the ways that the rate constant is quantified according to both transition state theory and collision theory. The Arrhenius relationship is also provided below. It is remarkable that the complex series of events that both collision theory and transition state theory try to quantify both display Arrhenius-like behavior. Based on the assumptions that are used to formulate both collision theory and transition state theory, transition state theory can be more broadly applied, since it uses general thermodynamic principles to quantify the rate constant. Collision theory explicitly uses the kinetic theory of gases to quantify the rate constant, so it reliably can only be applied to ideal gases, 